everyone. Welcome to my new Be German Studios Live Art Talk. I'm Colette Mello. And today we are here with Edison Penafiel. Um, I'd like to thank the City of Miami Beach for sponsoring these art talks and all of our art programming. Edison's work focuses on video, immersive, site-specific, multimedia installations that create surreal echoes of our world. Informed by his own life, Penafiel centers the migrant as a subject while his early photography focuses on deconstruction and perception, politics, his shifts towards multimedia installations has deepened his engagement with socioeconomic and political themes. Penafiel has presented his work at numerous venues, including the Bass Museum, the Museum of Contemporary Art Miami, the Orlando Music of, Museum of Art, the Atlantic Center of the Arts, and the University of South Florida, to name a few. He's won the prestigious James L. Grant Foundation Grant, the Florida Prize in Contemporary Art, and the South Florida Cultural Consortium Fellowship, also the Ellie's Awards. He currently lives in, works in Miami, and his work is, is represented by the Sabrina Amani Gallery in Madrid, Spain. So thank you for joining us, I'm gonna hand it over to you. So, um, these are two terms that I like to, to describe my work with. Um, <coughs> is constructed reality and perpetual cycles. So, I'm going to start with a brief description of both. One of them is constructed realities, which uh, refers to works of photography in which the scene and the subject have been staged specifically for the picture and in which the respective artist, in addition to the artist's role as a photographer or as a videographer in my case, uh, also plays the part of a director, designer, makeup artist and many times performers as well. And perpetual cycles uh, brings the idea of a perpetual feeling or state or a quality that one thing or event never ends or changes. So this is um, a body of work, one of my early uh, works called Barrio Alto. Uh, so we have these cityscapes made out of cardboard boxes and other assorted objects. Also the, the use of light um, and distance and different scales to create these distorted compositions as we see here. Uh, that resemble these cities. There is a theatricality going on, the interaction of these elements to accentuate say, uh, certain aspects of the image. <coughs> so, we have here some reference from uh, German Expressionism works, uh, especially films, as well as uh, Russian Constructivism. These two movements uh, provided the, the elements of design to create an image that will create tension uh, with the diagonals and the sharp lines, as well as um, uh, ideas of this work of perpetual cycles, which is reflected in the repetition, like uh, here the window shapes and also the patterns that are almost like, like a rhythm, a, a tempo. So with these compositions, I jumped into uh, photographing these uh, characters that I created out of these uh, mosquitoes, <coughs> uh, which was a previous work that I was exploring before. Uh, this series is called Los Chupasangres, The Bloodsuckers. And this, um, instead of physically co constructing the setting, I had this uh, character posing in front of a rear projection which was uh, a piece of uh, white plexiglass. Uh, so all of that you see there is, is in the stage, it's not Photoshop. And um, to me, um, it worked with this idea of constructing this reality, but in this case, uh, bringing uh, art history, like all these portraiture uh, paintings from a long time ago, and uh, to reference uh, power, in this case, military, political, or religious powers. Who are the models? Are these are these you or are these? These are some friends of mine. They're friends of uh, yeah, make these characters. And 
Was it the mosquitoes, or you were talking earlier before we started to talk about the project you were doing at FIU? That was after this. Oh, it was after this. Yeah. Okay. So here my my um, my stance was basically uh, being angry to these powers <laughs> and seeing this. Um, just like a, a critic to, to, to them. But uh, in the project that I mentioned to you before, um, which I don't have any pictures here, um, I was questioning us for being in that situation of, of the mosquitoes. Like it was a whole room filled out with these flying mosquitoes everywhere. And there were um, uh, life-size uh, paper mache sculptures naked with a projection of a naked body and just doing this. They, they're not even moving, just like, just pushing the mosquito away really softly. So they, they're in a way accepting that situation of, of these bloodsuckers around. <laughs> and yeah, and, and that piece was called, um, it is so because it's always been so. So here's the reference of uh, the photographs that I just showed. And um, so bringing reference to, from art history, the pose or the composition, uh, I mean the, the size of the, of the portraiture, right? Uh, which uh, has to do with symbols of power, considering the scale, the position, pose, the tones and dimensions, or the objects that are behind the, the subject, which in, in, the, in the images that I'm creating, this is a virtual image in, in the background, um, but it kind of really uh, creates a narrative between the subject and the and the, uh, car, the the environment in the background. So the background is virtual, and then you've taken a photograph in front of okay. yeah, to the car of the well, the character stands in front of the virtual background, so all of that is actually. Um, they were all mixed together instead of triptychs and um, it kind of relates, uh, tells the story of the beginning, middle and end of a migration journey um, and the only um, clue that I'm giving to the viewer is the way that these characters breathe. So in the beginning of the journey they're breathing normal, in the middle of the journey they, they are um, desperate, they don't what's gonna happen, so there's more anxiety kicking in. But in the end of the journey, they're more relaxed, they're relieved that this ended. And sometimes they're even behind bars, but they're relieved that the journey ended. So this is how it was installed, uh, another version with beauties and triptychs. And there's this kind of small narrative here. We have, um, this couple, right? Which in the middle of the journey stays the same couple, but in the end, there's only one character. So it's up to the viewer to make up the story. There. And there's other uh, elements that I included in, in the sound that um, also bring real stories. Like, for example, one of them has um, the sound of a bicycle. It's this one in the middle. And <coughs> It brings these absurd uh, situations um, that uh, when there were a lot of um, refugees from the Middle East going to the northern part of, of Europe, uh, especially Sweden and, and Norway. So there was this um, ONG in Sweden that will provide bicycles to migrants to cross the border Norway because they couldn't uh, because of the law they couldn't uh, walk the border 
for get a, a, a ride from from someone. So the, the loophole was entering with a bicycle. So the ONG will give um, bicycles to migrants, and you will see on the other side, on the Norwegian side, a dumpster full of bicycles. So that, that's kind of like the third thing that happened in migration that I like to include them like very subtle in the, the work. So this is another reference, uh, aesthetic reference from German Expressionism film and old French cinema focusing on the harsh contract, con contra, know, contrast quality <laughs> and the use of set design uh, illustrations combined with actual actual characters, like what happened with the, the Chupa Sangres or the Orpheus series, which is an animated background with a real person in the front. So this one is called Sempiterno. Um, which translate to sempiternal, something that has a beginning but doesn't have an end. And uh, this piece was presented at the Muse Orlando Museum of Art uh, for the Florida Prize uh, exhibition in 2019. And um, let me see. So the characters presented in this installation are as random as possible. I wanted to create a word that wasn't political at all, but ended up being political. <laughs> Way. How can you make them political art? Yeah. <laughs> I tried. <laughs> I tried. So, it, so this this piece kind of like um, told me again that yeah, it made sure that I needed to go this path of, of talking about politics and, and the things that bother me in a way. So we have these characters performing different actions, um, like Sisyphus and in an eternal manner. So we have this, um, let me show you. So we have these characters just doing random stuff, like meaningless. And the connection that I create with these uh, multiple screens, there are 32 screens in, in this corner, is, uh, and by exposing the cables, I make the connections between one bigger screen and the next one, and the next one, and the next one. And some of the videos are repeated, but at different tempos. So it's the information that we uh, get from cultures from different generations that we keep repeating over and over again. And some of the videos are blurry, but you still identify the, the, the action. So in a way, he's questioning why we keep doing the same things, that we even forgot uh, the reason why we started them, like hate between two countries. But questioning it in a in a way uh, that is not as direct, and um, also bringing uh, Pavlovian conditioning. There's a tick tock of a clock in this um, in this piece that is very subtle. You can barely hear it, and it comes sometimes and it goes off sometimes. But um, the idea is that we're conditioned by the clock, right, as a society. So we have to run some days because we need to be there at a certain time because we get paid by the hour and so on. <coughs> um, yeah, so this is kind of the, uh, a detail of the layout of the installation. So aesthetically, German Expressionism has been a big influence in my work, especially uh, this movie, The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari. This is a great example of the composition and distortion and division of the planes in sections to create uh, an absurd and surreal world and also an alternate reality. So I went on, on a summer, like for two different years, consecutive years, uh, to help an artist in Switzerland and Germany for uh, two, three exhibitions that she had there. Uh, since I didn't have my materials to create work, so I just grabbed the other assistant that was there and let's shoot something in the fields. Mm -hmm. So we, <laughs> I created this series called Campos Guro, uh, Black Dark Field. And it was on view at the Castillo Gallery in this um, arrangement. And um, the works were created in 2018 between Germany and Switzerland. 
and uh, it shows this uh, character person walking uh, from the side of the camera of the frame it, and it stops at, at a certain point in the frame and then she keeps walking toward the horizon until she disappears only to come back again creating that perpetual loop over and over again so another thing that uh, is important in the work is that I don't show faces I show masks or, or the back of people except for the chupa sangre but they were masked as well Sorry? Why is that? Why don't you do So, because um, they can represent anybody. Yeah, and, and you can connect better with, with them. It can be you, your family, your friend, or a story that you know of someone. So they, they become everyone. And, uh, and other things that I remove from my work is the specificity of, of region, age, religion. So it's as random as possible. I use type of clothing that well, that kind of not represent uh, an, uh, an era or a, um, or a region per se. Can you talk about the mask? Yes. So the masks are originally from Ecuador. They are made out of paper mache and um, the masks throughout history have been used um, for religious reasons mostly, but uh, and throughout, uh, well, throughout the world um, to assume an identity of, of a deity or, or something, right? Uh, so that the person who wears it is not them anymore, but someone else, right? So this mask uh, in my work works, uh, brings that idea of for example, a migrant moves to another country, right? If it is illegal, he needs to get fake documents. So the masks become a fake document, right? He's another person. But also um, assuming another identity um, because of a new, a new society, right? So I put, put my mask on to be able to behave in this society, right? To hide also. And uh, the masks are made out of paper mache for a tradition that we have there uh, that is called Año Viejo, uh, which is a paper doll puppet that like size that we burn at the end of the year at midnight. And uh, the idea is that it represents all the bad things that happened throughout the year, uh, throughout the past year, and you just burn it to, to start anew. And sometimes there are political figures and someone that was relevant in the world. And the thing is that Right before burning it, you beat the crap out of them, <laughs> just to release. Uh, so the material paper mache has already that struggle in it, right? That violence. So that's why I like to use that um, mask in my work because it, it already brings that uh, element of, of struggle, of pain, which is also related to a piñata, which is made out of paper mache as well. So this work is called uh, Ni aquí ni allá, neither here nor there. It was presented also at the um, Florida Prize in Contemporary Art, and this won the prize. And uh, this was created during an art residency in uh, North Carolina. And you can see these characters walking towards the horizon. And in a way, they're pulling these ropes, even though they're a video, uh, these physical ropes that are um, attached to these bundles of uh, belongings, like furniture, crates, and luggage, and there's some dishware, and other things. And the idea was to create this um, migration scene of, of pulling things, like heavy things that are stuck in the actual physical space. And they walk towards different um, landscapes like this, um, wheat field and then there's a cotton field, there's some trees, like there's a beach, a desert, and then the cityscape, you just you look back again and again on a perpetual loop. Uh, the 
size of this installation was like probably the room was 25 by 25 feet by 17 high. You can see some of the dishware there. So it was very potent to include this dishware, like this china cabinet from our grandmothers. <laughs> um, two persons that came out of the installation came out crying because of that. <laughs> but that I, this is one of my favorite pieces that I created. And you see these kids there, just to reference the size of the space. And just continue. So this is another view of the of the installation. So also bringing this aesthetic of the installation of the video into the the real world right we i think i painted these crates like kind of with the same aesthetic but mixing it with real objects like the luggage and all of that so it's, it's kind of like a hybrid world an alternate reality so here are more references again from early french cinema and german expressionism films that use uh, props and, and design, uh, set design, which is kind of what I did here. And this is Landscape. This was created during the North Presidency at 100 West Corsicana in Texas, 2019. Uh, this multimedia installation is composed of multiple digital projections on chiffon fabric, sound, and a fence of text and barbed wire. Um, the, this piece was presented during the South Florida Cultural Consortium exhibition at the Museum of North, of the North Miami Museum. Okay. 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 So this is a video um, documentation of that piece, but in Corsicana, in Texas. So there was something interesting that happened to me during that residency. Not to me, but with the space, because this was a historic space used by the, built by the Othellos, which is a, a fellowship, kind of like the Masons. <coughs> and on the third floor, which was my whole studio, uh, they would do reenactment of Old Testament stories. Uh, they would do rituals of initiation. And they will have like this small closet with this like, normal door, but on the side there was a, a rectangle opening. I didn't know what it was. So I asked Kyle, the, the owner of the residency, and he told me that they would do uh, projections with uh, magic lanterns, like 100 years ago. So all of that made sense to me in creating this piece with uh, like the reenactments of Old Testament stories, Exodus, um, the rituals of initiation, but the ritual part is like repeating something, like never ending. So these people walk forever in this landscape in a perpetual loop. And the magic lantern, of course, I'm using digital projections now in a contemporary way. The landscape goes from a grass field to this cotton field that you see here, then um, boulders or rocks, and after that there's um, water. So the, my characters end up walking on water. So what is the desperation to, to escape, right? That they even have that quality of walking on water. And they're a mask, and they are some, there's some animal masks as well to bring this, this um, element of uh, migration that is natural, right? It's part of the DNA of living things, even coronavirus migrated. <laughs> So I like to use the materials. Uh, it's uh, because I could have made these characters multiply uh, digitally, but they were projected on chiffon fabric. So using the, the magic of the, the fabric, which is translucent and let me project through many layers, so I decided to multiply the, the characters in an analog way with, with the fabric. So so the characters repeat up to three layers. Here and 
the butterflies that surround the whole room, or? Uh, just in front of the characters, so to separate the space of my characters and the viewer's space. Okay. So there's that separation. It's, uh, it's segregation, right? So it's them and us. Them, black and white, us, color. Them, larger than life size, us, regular size. And I always, well, this piece um, always put the projections, the projectors on the floor. So when the viewer walks around the space, uh, they can cast their own shadow and become one of the characters as well. Um, let's see. So there are 60 different characters in this um, uh, procession. And um, So the characters have different clothing, like and even gas masks, um, just to not be a specific at all. So here we have uh, some reference as well from uh, the Panathenae uh, procession, as a reference to the ritualistic mass movement of, of people. Uh, this religious culture surrounds the perimeter of the temple of Athena. Athena. Uh, in a loop. So in a way I like to see these reliefs as an archaic, archaic um, form of video which relates to my work but also a translation of the previous project into the next format. Like from this landscape uh, installation, which is a BIM installation, I proposed this for the Walgreen windows by the Bass Museum um, as a public piece because we couldn't use projection in daylight. In the, in daylight. Uh, I decided to print these um, characters and we paste them to, to the wall and put this barbed wire in front of them. And from this, uh, also tapping into art history, I created landscape paintings. So bringing uh, this idea of, of art, art history, but instead of using the landscape format, I use the portrait format too. Uh, um, to have these characters um, in the act of escaping, right? So it becomes a landscape painting. And uh, this, um, this series is a collection of 10 paintings, which are nine by seven feet in dimension. Uh, this was presented at Piero Achugare Gallery in, in Miami, and they're now in Madrid, in my gallery. And this project was funded by the Knight Foundation. Um, and uh, the medium is acrylic wall paint on canvas. Um, these characters are printed on archival cotton paper and we <coughs> paste it into this canvas. And there's a fence in front of, of these characters, uh, again, to separate the, the viewer from, the, from these characters. So the elements that I always use in, in my work are super important and I'm not a painter. This is the first time that I painted. And decided to go with wall paint to, to bring the reference of street art to of property, right? Like a wall, a house. Um, and we paste these characters as if they were like street art or, or propaganda posters, right? So it's an invasion of property and talking about how migrants are viewed uh, as invaders, right? So bringing all of that in, in the conversation. These characters are larger than life size, they're black and white, and they're crossing these colorful, uh, abstract um, landscapes. And um, just to make reference that they don't belong there, or they don't belong to, to the world that we are inhabiting that space and so it's kind of like bringing these um, writings by uh, Fernando de Magallanes when he was talking about the giants of the Patagonia and this is kind of like these giants of Patagonia this, this is them right so this was uh, arranged this piece was actually created for this space and all of them are facing Wait. That's the Archie Gallery. Piero Chugarri Gallery. Yeah. And 
and uh, all because of this vaccine sign. <laughs> <laughs> This is one of the last photo series that I have um, created. This is called uh, Eras Una Vez, Once Upon a Time. I have made six of them. Um, and they were because of a conversation that I was having during that time uh, about my grandparents. So these uh, are a representation of my grandpas, my grandparents, uh, not in the physical form, but uh, in their persona and not in the situations that I just made like super random situations that they never lived, but uh, their persona will act in that way. Like my grandma was like super tiny, but she was like stronger than my, <laughs> my grandpa emotionally and all of that. So in this bumping, uh, we see her taking the lead, right? persons which the one on the right his name is my full grandpa's name is Edison Oliver Vera Sigal and the other one is uh, it's called El Mayor <laughs> the other one which is also the same grandpa but I just split them into two persons because one uh, this one was more of an outlaw he he will go to jail and because of political reasons and yeah and the other one was just like the home person and this is my grandma her name is uh, Angela Rebecca Rafaela Robles Huacón de Vera <laughs> yeah and uh, they already passed away uh, while I was here I couldn't go to the funeral and um, this image is called Terminal like a bus terminal and I created it because my grandpa was going to, well, he went to another city to Guayaquil to get his uh, heart checked, like his monthly check, but he couldn't make it. So my grandpa died in the bus terminal. So you see my grandma here with his uh, sweater. Yeah, and, and he's not there. But the bus terminal is bringing this idea of transition as well, right? As that, so that moment of, of leaving, letting go. This is Marema. This is one of the largest projects that I have created up to date. Um, this is a 12 channel video installation. Uh, it took like five months of editing, and I started collaborating with a company in Dania Beach that they are video producers. They're a, a visual agency that uh, helped me with the printing of the landscape paintings, characters. And then I approached to them to, uh, with this challenge to create this 12 channel animation style, uh, video uh, that will have these boats navigating throughout uh, an animated seascape on a perpetual loop throughout these 12 projections. And I approached them because they, well, I didn't have the power on this computer to handle that amount of information. So uh, we filled up like two hard drives of 10 terabytes each, just for this project. And they have to build a computer to handle the, the projections of this project. And um, this is the video document of the work. That's me on the side just for size reference. So Maremagnum is the old name that the Romans gave to the Mediterranean Sea and this, this was uh, built specifically for my gallery. My gallery is in Madrid for their space and the, basically it's a conversation between um, what happens in the Mediterranean but also I live here in Miami what happens in the Caribbean, right? With these waves of, of migrants coming. And uh, again, I don't reference any specific time. So we have 
have these different types of boats in the in the animation. Um, so it, there, you're gonna even see uh, bike boats. So they're kind of like very minimal, but from different times aesthetically. <coughs> and the tune is a uh, deconstructed uh, lullaby from South America that talks about uh, the sea and it was deconstructed in a way that these characters are trying to remember the tune but they can until the end of, of the whole loop and, and this tune is, is just to sub unconsciously trying to be in a safe place right which is the, the lullaby the, the mother right so I mentioned the mother, the mother because the title of the piece, Mare Magnum, has a different, uh, um, well, not different etymology, but Mare uh, has different meanings, meanings in different languages. Mare is sea in, in Latin and also Italian, yeah, in Italian, but it also means nightmare in some French and Nordic languages, and also mother as well. So all of these three meanings are brought into the, the installation with the lullaby, with the sea, and, and with the rocking, right? The rocking of the boat, but it's also the rocking of the, the baby. So after this, well, during this installation, we had another solo show because the gallery has two spaces in Madrid. The center of Madrid and another in the outside of the city. Um, this one is called Mare Magnum La Llegada, the, the arrival. So all of the characters that you see on the installation were uh, photographed and uh, they have been processed by uh, an immigration entity with these numbers that you see there. Yeah, they have been stamped and these photographs are unique. So there's 81 of them. And uh, so we have Mare Magnum, the installation, which is the journey throughout the seas that never ends. We have La Llegada, which is the arrival. They have been stamped. So last week we released this series of NFTs with the company that I'm working in, Daniel Beach. Uh, this one is called Mare Magnum Ultramarine. Ultramarine means uh, those from beyond the sea. And it's a collection of 15, um, images that form a, a, a panoramic view of this situation and we have these characters in, in, in the in between process between uh, the la llegada and, and the installation right so they're um, getting off the, the boats and arriving to this on this close or unidentified coastline These are some projects that I haven't presented yet. <laughs> um, this one is called Me Pongo el Sol al Hombro y el Mundo es Amarillo. It's from uh, the lyrics, or no, not the lyrics. It's the introduction to one of the songs by Facundo Cabral. Um, I forgot the name of the song. No soy de aquí ni soy de allá. And uh, I'm not from here, not from there. Um, so this pieces were created during an art residency in North Carolina, the McCall Center. These are uh, curtain pieces, double-sided, and they are made out of fabric. Um, this large piece of canvas was painted with acrylic wall paint, and all of these flowers uh, were cut out uh, out of a sort of fabric. Uh, we cut 1,700 flowers. And, uh, created these compositions of these people resting in this garden of flowers. These flowers are lily flowers that have um, this um, meaning of transition. And my mother's name is Azucena and she came to, uh, to help me with, during this residency uh, to do all the borders of the, of the curtains. But I ended up doing it myself because <laughs> I'm too picky. <laughs> <laughs> So 
her name is Azucena, which is Lily Flower, so I created this garden for her, but she doesn't know. <laughs> so this is uh, how the work should look, and this is the size of a person. And um, yeah, so this can be installed in, in a, like a semicircle. So when you enter the space, you see this green and this uh, yellow wall, but on the other side is um, is a blue, a baby blue kind of wall. And most of the characters here are sitting and resting, except for this one on the right side. But there's only two characters in the back that are walking to this side of the of the car. And this is the last project that I've been working for the past two years. Uh, this is called Arturus and the Artist and Thesis of Time. Um, this is a project that um, it started as a movie, then through a class on uh, NFT for creatives with Tam Green, every class was just like mind blowing and expanding and exploding this, this uh, project with new ideas and possibilities uh, to create. So this is just uh, a test. We were testing a, um, what's it called, a digital volume, which is a giant TV that you can uh, perform in front, like they did uh, the Mandalorian um, series. And um, so you create the digital environment, you put it on that big TV, and then um, you sync it with the camera. So when the camera moves, also the environment moves accordingly to, to create a better perspective. <coughs> so this um, work brings another uh, story of migration, but not specifically migration, but it's, it's kind of like a spiritual journey of this character, Arcturus, which is the, the main character, not him, but the other one. Um, these characters, which are 13 of them, evolve throughout the journey. From the, uh, They start as a group of sheep on the first scene, guided by a tiny coyote. And on the next scene, they, all of the, let's see, the, the sheep become ants because of the terrain that they need to, to uh, confront. And next, they become wolves and there's a fight. And this Arcturus person, character, uh, becomes what he finally needs to be because Arcturus means uh, protector of the bear. So he becomes a, a bear uh, to protect his partner. And after that, they become um, dogs. And there's a scene that they become sardines. And the final scene, they become swallows. And I have Greek mythology mixed here with uh, some other myths from Mexico, Central and South America, and also popular culture like Maradona. <laughs> and other people um, involved. And the idea with this project is to um, expand it uh, into the NFT world with metaverse. So the idea will be like people could enter the movie space in 3D and find things that I probably can leave there for you to get, like prices or, or you can watch the movie from, from the perspective that you want. And also NFTs of the characters as collectibles. So because we have 13 characters that uh, evolve as they progress in their journey, there's a total of 53 characters in their uh, whole evolution. And we will create scenes that are specific for NFTs that are not gonna be part of the movie. And, we, and the movie is gonna be presented as a multi-channel movie, not as a single frame. So we'll have a, a large gallery space with six screens 
and the viewer needs to follow the characters to be able to, to follow the narrative of the story. So you go from screen one to screen two and so on. While you're on screen uh, five, there's something that's happening on two and three. So you really need to be aware of uh, what is happening everywhere to, to really make up the story. And the story is a loop, so there's no beginning or end. But there's actually a beginning, but it loops. <laughs> and um, we are working, we have the, the script for this uh, multi-channel film and we're currently working on the script for the one channel version of, of this film that is gonna have alternate scenes as well. And so they will be determined by the NFT, the alternative scenes or just by what you do? By, uh, we have to see that how it's gonna evolve. Okay. The first thing that we need to finish is the multi-channel film because that was, that is gonna be presented next year at the USF camp. Tampa. Um, so yeah, but the other ones we haven't developed yet um, conceptually, uh, but there's like a big plan for this project. It's to, the idea is to create a, a universe out of this with um, other stories, other movies as well, uh, like sequels or prequels. Like we have the description of each one of the characters, their, their, their persona, their profile, which can easily be uh, a video piece, just their stories, right? Before the journey. Does technology play a role in how the characters develop, or is technology, and I'm thinking NFT or video technology that allows you to show it, is it more something geared towards how the audience experiences it? Like, is it is technology used internally in your work to help it help you conceptually think about it, or is it used more as a means to either make an NFT collectible for someone like me who's going to buy it, or or you know, or make the, the video more immersive for me who's going to consume it? Uh, now, technology is uh, a big part of the of the work to to the development because well, I haven't had those. Um, tools before and now I have it with this company. Mm -hmm. Before it, I didn't have a studio, uh, a studio so the way that I would work is think about a project for four months, solve it in my head, go to an art residency for two months, production. Mm -hmm. I already have the piece in my head, I just need to make it. Yeah. Uh, but this time it has been like a difficult, <laughs> but a, um, a difficult journey but um, super interesting because of the possibilities. So this test that, that uh, I just showed you is the first option that we had to make this film because they had this giant screen and we just need to create the props that go in front of the screen and put the characters acting there. But that will be so limiting when they brought this other option of scanning all of the characters and making them like digitally and we can perform it with motion capture suits. Yeah. So volumetrically capturing them. Yeah. And, um, and act them and make them giants and make them fly and make them do whatever we want. So the, the possibilities are endless now. Mm -hmm. And it's just deciding what to do with them. <laughs> yeah. How is that different, say, than like a, 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 a traditional high-tech film, like, you know, where where superheroes fly or have superpowers. I mean, these guys, sounds like they could have superpowers pretty easily. Is that um, part of the... It, they're, they're, um, they're humans, and there's some guts in there, like Poseidon and Zeus that know the deal, but the other yeah, ones are, are yeah. ignorant to, to know what happens to them. And Zeus uh, controls this journey, so he wants to keep this perpetual journey. This other character, Arcturus, he doesn't know, but in the middle of the journey, he kind of knows how to exit this loop. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like a spiritual liberation of this perpetual loop of the creation of Zeus. And um, yeah, just exploring the different possibilities of, of NFTs. What do you 
do NFTs bring to your work? I'm sorry? What do NFTs bring to your work, to you? How, what, how, do you how do you think about them? Um, well, it's, I think for artists in general, it's a, it's a way to free themselves financially. Financially, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. And the, the idea of royalties is, is amazing, which never happens in, in the art world. Mm -hmm. And um, it's other type of consumers as well that I haven't been able to to navigate <laughs> because it's, it's crypto people and it's gamers, the ones who collect the most NFTs. Yeah. Art people are very afraid of them. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's kind of navigating both both worlds, but uh, the the idea of this film classes that I took with this person, Tam Green, um, is to create this hybrid. So this piece is gonna have a physical presence that you can experience, but also you can collect it through NFTs or um, immerse to a metaverse, right? So it, it's creating this, this possibility for both um, viewers, I guess, <laughs> which is the end of the crypto and, and the art world. When you say immerse in a metaverse, you mean put on a headset and see it, like, and watch the film in the headset? Yeah. Okay. But you can navigate the film. And you can walk be behind potentially the behind the characters and yeah. in back in near the tree. And yeah. And yeah, it's, it's just an idea right now. Yeah. It, it, I don't know if it's going to happen or not. Yeah. But it's like, for example, the film will happen at a certain time. You miss it, you need to wait until the next day. Yeah, and there's other things that uh, you can leave behind, like other NFTs hidden under the sand or mm -hmm. something. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. It's just um, kind of game gamifying the work. And yeah, any more questions? This is it. <laughs> so far, this um, those. These are pieces of fa fabric that we cut on, on a laser cutter, yeah. and they were with paste it on the other fabric. Paste it on it, not sew. Just paste it. Okay. Very, very good. With a fabric. Uh, it wasn't with paste. It was like a fabric adhesive. An iron, maybe? No, it wasn't iron. Okay. And then your mother was helping you, but... No, she, she was there. helping me. Uh, she was the help. I thought you were too picky. I'm sorry? I thought you were too picky and your mom was the one to help you. <laughs> she helped me uh, do the the seams on the border. Oh, I see. Yeah, but I was too picky because she was going like uh, on the side like, no. <laughs> Show me how to do it on this. <laughs> yeah. But they were too heavy as well. They're yeah, super heavy. Because these are like, uh, let me see. They're huge. 10 feet tall and by 14. Oh. 